ชื่อกันนะดีวะอันนั้นเอาวันของกูเออลองเลยฮัลโหลฮัลโหลฮัลโหลสุ
Alors, tu sens un peu fort. Okay, I can't go out home. So I... So she can. So I did it. Sous le 
Oui, bah, ça m'a annoncé le jour.
happier moments in his future endeavors. It is, uh, I think, the second time I'm witnessing somebody presenting a lecture after he has exited. The first one, I think, was Professor, late Professor Mahdi Adamu, who made his uh, inaugural lecture about 30 years after. Uh, we also pray for his repose. May Allah make his abode to be in the general fellows. For Professor Alugungu, I can't see him. I think he's around. Uh, he's, he's 70 years old. We pray uh, that, well, I wouldn't say he repeats another 70 years, but I pray that he, uh, may Allah uh, make his life, the, the, the remaining years, to be very fruitful. I will indeed benefit from him, and I hope we shall continue benefiting from him. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat amma yasifun, wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, wa alhamdulillah rabbil alim. MashaAllah, that was the opening prayer by Professor Bindo. Let me introduce members of the high table. First is Professor Ibrahim Magawata, Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, who is standing in for the Vice Chancellor. We have the, the University Liberian, Chief e, Dr. A.K. Dr. A.K. Nu. I will be announcing, some of them may not be on the high table, but uh, please, when I mention the name, please let, let him stand up for uh, recognition. Uh, we have Professor A.M. Gada, Professor Harun Abdullah Ibrahim, who has just presented an opening prayer, Professor Amin Salih Humika Ilu, former vice, former vice chancellor of Osman Nafur University. Sir. We have Professor Zadis Ahmad Yaka Sayyid, our teacher. <laughs> Professor Sheikh Hussein Ibrahim, Department of Modern and Regional Research. We have the Dean, Faculty of Arts and Islamic Studies, Professor Mishan. <laughs> Professor Ahmad Babo is the chairman of this occasion. So, I continue to recognize uh, dignitaries at the arrival. Let's not forget that in student affairs, Professor Amir Mode is also around. Uh, the next item is Chairman's opening remarks. May I use this opportunity to invite the, the, the Vice Chancellor Osman Danford University, Sapolu, who it's being represented by Professor, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Adibin, Brian Bagawata, for the uh, opening remarks. So. Alhamdulillah, Bismillah, Alim, Minish Shadan, Rajim, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, the University Library, Dr. Kenuru, the Dean of Student Affairs, Professor Muhammad Amir Mode, the Dean of Faculty of Islamic Studies, Professor Isa Muhammad Meshano, the former Dean and the former Director of Kaaba, Professor W. Akin Hassan, other members of the high table here are present, former Vice Chancellors here are present, Deans and directors, heads of department, all professors holding established chairs, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On behalf of the Senate and the General University Community, and on behalf, I'm standing for the Vice Chancellor who happened to travel this afternoon. On behalf of them, I welcome all of you to this all important occasion, an occasion where the 23rd inaugural lecture will be delivered 
by no other person than Professor Tahiru Muhammad Arugungu, who has retired on the 22nd of June 2021. The Vice Chancellor has asked me to extend the commendation of the university over his courage to make sure that he has delivered this inaugural lecture despite the fact that he has exceeded. This is a very, very commendable effort and uh, we appeal to all the other staff who are also on the verge of going out of the system to also make sure that they follow same suit. I implore all of you to please listen attentively to the presentation that is going to be made. This is with a view to understanding what the contributions that has been, have been made by the inaugural. We thank you all and uh, we hope as we have promised that the presentation will be a continuous one. It is, it is not going to be, no longer going to be a discontinuous one. Uh, you see, in my film, we have fishes that have what we call continuous lateral line. A lateral line is a sensitive part which sends messages to the other parts of the body, to the brain. So it's a communication channel. So, and uh, most of the fishes have continuous lateral line, while very few, like in the case of Oreochromis naletopus and the Sarotherodon galileus, these species have this continuous lateral line. We do not want these inauguration, inaugural lectures to be discontinuous. God willing, it will be a continuous process, and we hope to reach 100 by the end of 2022. Thank you, and may God bless you. That was Brian Magawata, Professor, Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration. This is an opportunity every academic wants to attend. That is uh, presenting an inaugural lecture. Let me quickly, quickly recognize the presence of Professor Akin Hassan, Professor Matazu from Law, Professor Magaji. Gwandu from Veterinary Medicine and Professor Ayo Salau, our Baba. You are all welcome, sir. Uh, next on the program is the citation of the of, of the presenter. And uh, I'm using this opportunity to invite no any other person but a linguist. Professor uh, actually he's going there, he's getting there, inshallah. Dr. Muhammad Angu Alew is to come and present and tell us who Professor Nairo Muhammad Arungu is. Sir, over to you. Yes, may I invite uh, Professor Nairo Muhammad Arungu the Enoguri, to please come forward for the citation. Professor Muhammad Ayuru was born on the 22nd June 1951 in Argungu town, Kebi State. 
to the family of Madam Muhammad Nagaya and Madam Aisha Ibrahim Argumu, the daughter of Sarkin Kabi Muhammad Usama. Both parents were among the first set of Mboko in Argungu. They, they taught virtually numerous later generations of Mboko in Argungu Everett, particularly in Argungu town, Kangiwa, Kamba, and Bayoa districts. Their book, Education World All in Hausa, Mom, wrote down her birthday, I mean his birthday in his work, in her works. Hai Huwari Yaru, Ishirin Debiu Gawata in Shidda, 1951. So he saw his birthday certificate from her, his mom. Being the only Yaru to her, he soon realized what it was his birthday she recorded in her diary in Hausa language. Malam Muhammad Nagaya of blessed memory passed on in 1972. He received the same message of his passing away when Prof. Argungu was at Bidda as a produce officer. It was his uncle who contacted him through a telegram, which was then the only available means of communication. His mom, Malama Aisha, passed away in 2004. May Allah have mercy on them. His educational career background. From Argungu, after his Quranic and primary education at Argungu, he attended the prestigious uh, uh, provincial school, Sokoto, now renamed the College, in 1965. He passed out in 1969. From Argungu, received his BA Linguistics French from the University of Jos in 1981, MA Linguistics from the University of Khartoum, Sudan, in 1988, his PhD in linguistics from Islamic University in Uganda. In addition to this, he has obtained other professional qualifications which include Certificate in Secretarial Studies Federal Training Center Kaduna between 1972 and 1974. Certificate in Official Baba Team Reporting Federal Training Center Lagos in 1976, certificate in short time speed, 121 p.m. Pittman Examination Institute, London, from 1976. Another certificate in short time speed was 140 p.m. Pittman Examination Institute, London, also in 1976. Certificate in journalism, the Muslim Institute, London City, University of London, 1984. Certificate in Arabic language, International Arabic Institute for Non-Arabic Speakers, Khartoum, Sudan, in 1987. Certificate in Arabic Language, Islamic African Center, Khartoum, Sudan, in 1988. Certificate in Drama and Theatre Skills Training, the British Council Islamic University in Uganda, 1996. Certificate in Swahili Education Research and Academy, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in 1997. Postgraduate Diploma in Swahili Islamic University, Uganda, in 1997, professional certificate in education at Madhubi University in Zaria 2017, and certificate registration teachers training council of Nigeria 2020. <laughs> Professor Arungu started his working career as a teacher with Minister of Education Sokoto in 1970. Confidential Secretary of Foreign Minister, uh, of Education.
only two. B. Hi, on the shoe and the big one. Oh, I'm not the key to you. Yeah, I'm Now I got a Who speaks and has working knowledge? He speaks this language fluently, very fluently. And these languages are English, French, Arabic, Swahili. Besides his native Hausa language, Algomo retired from the service of the university on the 22nd June 2021, having clocked 70 years. He had visited a number of countries and uh, towns within and outside. He visited the United Kingdom in 1984 and 1988. Sudan in 1985 and 1989. Saudi Arabia, 1988, 1999 and 2009. Niger Republic, 1991, 2002, 2014, 2016. Uganda from 1996, Senegal, 1996, 2015. Kenya, 2001. Tanzania, 2002. Zambia, 2002. South Africa, 2011. Cameroon, 2012. Algeria, 2016. Professor Albungu is happily married to Hajia Hawa'u Usman Albungu. They are blessed with 13, 19 kids. <laughs> Sorry, nine kids. and 13 grandchildren. Now, look at top, at 72 now. At 72, uh, 71, you are into 71 now. Yes, he's still looking fresh. You know, he looks younger than the age. He's intact. He's hell and hearty. He's agile and full of stamina. I say this because this is Argun Kudar Khan's you know, deliberate lecture, three hour lecture, while standing. Look at him, he doesn't do anything. So, so I, still, I envy him and I say, You are blessed. And I think this happens because there was no trouble at all. I want to believe that Hadia Awau has contributed to making who Professor Argun is today. Thank you, Please, distinguished personalities, may we have a standing ovation in honor of Professor Nairo Muhammad al -Gur. You can see that the history is full. The CV is saturated. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mashallah. Let me quickly we organize the presence of Professor Yamakubakar, Dr. Fadal Enureni, Head of Department of English Language and Linguistics, Usman Afford University, and some of his students are here to honor this occasion. 
Uh, Mr. Sunday, I'm going to stand in for the Registrar of the University. May I now invite the Vice Chancellor, who is being represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Professor Magawata, to invite the inaugural lecture presenter. Uh, on behalf of the University Senate, I have the privilege to invite the inaugural lecture presenter for the 23rd inaugural lecture titled Hausa and the National Language Question in Nigeria. Privileges, prospects, and predicaments. Professor Dahir Muhammad Agungu, please, over to you. The Vice Chancellor, sir, is represented by Professor Brian Magawata. Vice Chancellor. Are also away on assignment. Other distinguished personalities here in your various capacities. Professors here again in your various capacities and professions. Deans, directors, heads of department staff and students, members of the press, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is a great pleasure to stand before you, having thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has allowed us this day to meet this hour to fulfill one of the obligations of a professor. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for seeing me through blocking this age of 70. By my friends, those who are out of it, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take them to this stage nation and be it. May he give them also the courage to fulfill this important academic assignment. Uh, it was a couple of months before my retirement. I just felt that I should feel, fulfill this uh, important academic responsibility by presenting this lecture. I was also pushed, or rather counseled by a number of people, some academic, some non-academic staff, to try and do this. And I thought about it, and I come to life today, I'm here to fulfill this obligation. I thank you very much for giving me this wise counsel. The topic for my lecture, even though I have not been told for how long I will be speaking, it means maybe it's uh, some frontier, like doctors without borders. Okay. Uh, 
uh, when I thought about uh, the topic, knowing what an inaugural lecture is, at least to my understanding, I thought the best is to talk to you about most of my research papers have revolved on, and this is uh, the issue of Hausa language. Of the th 63 papers I have written, about half or more than half are really on Hausa linguistics. And uh, this is not accidental because as you have heard from the person who read my citation, I spent 18 years. Actually, the Department of Nigerian Languages was my entry point when I joined the university in October 1984. And uh, later, I moved to the Department of Modern European Languages. So having read li linguistics and uh, having also this uh, little capacity of speaking in these languages, some of them, I was able to move from one language department to another. Now, throughout my history, I think I have been associated with languages and communication. My colleagues are here, my classmates, please kindly stand up so that the congregation can see. Class of 69, Nagarta College. Are they here? Okay, I can see only one. Bye. However, we are like alike, alike charges and alike charges. If I can uh, uh, try to uh, go to an area that is not mine. Because Atahir was a specialist, he was a director in the Ministry of Education. I think handling mathematics, which I always run away from. And that was why I ended up with languages. So uh, that's just uh, a very brief history and about. Now, concerning the, the topic, the topic is titled and the national language question in Nigeria, privileges, prospects, and predicaments. I believe we all may have some idea about the issue of the choice of a national language for a country. And uh, when I realized that quite a number of my researches have been in this area, I thought probably this is uh, one aspect I should share. And therefore, that's just how about the title came about. Now, if you have a copy of the paper, or even if you don't have it, my preamble has touched on the general aspect of the number of languages in Nigeria. We have over 500 languages. And I think up to today we are guessing, really. Because sometimes even the population, our population, is cited as 170, 180, and I think the highest is 200. We are still not quite sure. I hope we will have accurate figures. Now, if figures for individual speakers are difficult to come by, then what do you think of figures in relation to the languages they speak? So therefore, uh, one of the commonest figures quoted is 500 plus. And you can Google this. And incidentally, I have written a song which I call the song of our languages. 
with the title uh, Languages of Right or what are Harsun in Nigeria? May take on Harsun Mu again Al I have translated the, the song. And probably this should be my opening before I go into the net. The rhyme is our languages are our pride. And I say we begin in the name of God, song of our languages, in his name the glorious Noah of all languages, praises for his messenger, the herald, hero of all Arabs, and his family members and companions, majority Arabs. Speech and tongue empowered Adam, father of nations, among his endowment, Nigeria, its myriad languages. Our languages are our pride. Our languages rise in size like tide in a nation of immense wide, yet we take our tongues for a ride. But in language there is a might. There is beauty, there is pride. Through them we speak the mind. Think of a teacher with her teaching or an advertiser with his advertising. Perhaps a hawker with her hawking. Hear a drum. Language binds all by way of speaking. Our languages are our pride. When in the house holding a session or in a house staying with a relation and really have a mission, even where you very lack a vision, but then you clearly insist on your mission. Language offers you words in succession. Now, I will not read all, so I will conclude with a few stanzas. I now call them out in fashion like constellation. As you listen, think about them with more admiration. Listen, read, speak, and write them with more dedication. Communicate and experience them during social interaction. Remember, we are a territory with their largest concentration in Africa and beyond, if we have to say by way of illustration. Our languages are our pride. Kanuri, Ijo, Isekiri, Tarok, Anang, Chilela, Gamay, Hon, Sikimba, Batunu, Mada, Yangam, Ikwere, Bachu, Busa, and then finally, our tongues, so many, not easy to sight. Part of the nation's resources flying like kite. A huge drive for our unity without doubt. We keep them in use and never sound right through love and practice with all our might. To our leaders, we again and again recite, our languages are our pride. Our languages are our pride. Our languages are our pride. <laughs> Now, I just felt that languages for which there is a mother tongue thing already declared should be uh, celebrated. So it is with this kind of mindset I set out to talk about Hausa and the national language question, focusing on its privileges, its prospects, and the decrements. I say that linguistically speaking, Nigeria is a rich, indeed a very rich nation. This is a very difficult argument because people can only see wealth in terms of oil, in terms of other resources that we can see, tangible resources. But intangible resources, people rarely find or understand them as resources. But we should understand that languages are resources. What is a resource? A resource is a supply of anything you have as a, an individual or perhaps an account or an organization or company which you can use in order to improve your welfare. So, language are primarily involved in us. But as we come out, Assigned a particular value to us. And this is why My some are Jews, some are Muslims, some are Igbos, some are Jews, and so on and so forth. But 
there is a strong relationship between them and ethnicity. And this is why when people mislead why God has languages, they try to seek vengeance on others. People create a image on social media and so on and so forth. Because Lambda is a tool. It is an instrument which can be used or it can be abused. So I believe uh, it is important that we understand Lambda as part of the process of a nation. And this is where I say that I am blessed with this. Regulatively, in Nigeria, Lambda is neither seen as a resource nor as an index of development as understood in the more technologically advanced societies of Western Europe, Asia, and the Arab world. Many of us who have been to Europe or to other places outside Nigeria are fully aware that one of the first things that confronted us if you went there as a student was to ensure that you were there in the language library. Doctors who graduated from Bulgaria or studied Bulgaria those who went to France must have studied French. Those who went to Germany must have studied German, Italian, and so on and so on. So it all comes to because languages are simple resources and they are therefore seen as simple resources. Nations, these societies and countries are like jobs. And I think it is important to stress here that one reason why so called Developed countries are developed is largely or partly of course they use their mother tongues as a media of instruction in schools. And conversely, one reason why we have problems here for their education is because the mother tongue is not the primary language of instruction in school. So we battle with it until we get to the university and probably until we get to the end of our life, there are many sectors of the language we will never understand. However, this is not to say that one cannot uh, be educated in a second language or a language which is what is mother tongue. I think what is important is to stress that languages uh, are primarily means of communication, but each language has its own structure, and therefore, if you come to study, you have to confront these issues. Now, very briefly, uh, after the, I have the introduction, and here I have talked about Nigeria's official language, that is English, which was chosen right uh, from independence up to the moment. And uh, I have argued here that uh, one of the reasons why uh, the issue of national language has been delayed in Nigeria is because people say that Nigeria has too many languages. And if you choose any one language as the national language or official language, of course you should remember that there is a difference between a national language and official language. A national language has to be one of the indigenous languages of a country, whereas an official language can be a language, could be a foreign language or a foreign language. Okay. So because of this, people argue that we should allow sleeping dogs to lie by giving English to serve as the official language of Nigeria, which is a uh, fine fragment. But uh, we have to realize that we have other tongues. And uh, any time we think of any language over and above the languages of our heritage, then we are getting from them every day. Even though this is not something you can immediately see because it's a very slow progress, it happens in decades or even thousands of years, the change is still there. And when we don't be surprised if any of the family members in the generation find it difficult to see, speak the mother tongue because the influences are cumulative. 
So there are countries that have far more than Nigeria than Nigeria. For example, Papua New Guinea, which is a huge island in the Pacific Ocean, has 840 languages. 840. But the size of the country is just about two states of Nigeria, approximately. How they be able to resolve this? Because they have a national language, which is called Top Pisin. It's a Creole language. But still, it is the mother tongue of so many. In uh, Indonesia, with 710 languages, they have Bahasa Indonesia as the mother tongue, and also the language of instruction in school. In Japan, many other places, and of course, our more technologically advanced today, the Republic of China, if you remember, the education of China is like the Chinese. And Chinese are among the most probably, I'm sorry to say this, that we can meet who cannot speak very good English. The issue is, there is a need about the issue of mother tongue. Some people say that our mother tongue cannot deliver science. You cannot teach physics, chemistry, biology in Yoruba, or physics, chemistry, biology in Hausa, or in Kanu or any other language. This is a myth. It is not the language, it is the speaker of the language who does the creation. So the creativity is actually with the speaker of the language and not the language itself. So stop blaming language and insist that we should be the creators so that uh, we demonstrate to the world that just like the Western world is able to use its languages to develop technologically, we also have that capacity in Nigeria and in Africa generally. So then, uh, I have on the next about 23 papers I have written, all talking about how someone said, uh, I have seen you are the only one here. Yes, yes. I have the right to the papers alone, except one. There is a paper I decided uh, to write. Uh, along with my colleagues in the computer department when I felt that there is need for us to have a synergy in this university and that this is, this is very, very important. All the departments of languages should actually synergize and see what contributions can we make along with our colleagues in the computer department and ICT. Now the world is digital and there are a number of things going out there in relation to languages. There is what is called natural language processing. There is artificial intelligence. There is speech recognition and all of that. Unless departments come together in this university, it will be very difficult for any one department to get to that point. So I am really calling on management to look into this and please, whether by, what shall I wouldn't say force, but at least we should all come together so that uh, we find out what we can do in relation to di digital linguistics, because linguistics now has moved from the traditional sector to the di digital sector, and it will be for the benefit of the university and the country. So one of the papers I wrote along with my colleagues in the computer department, actually was a submission we gave to the Nigerian Communication Council concerning the development of uh, outer Actually, it's developed, or it was developed along with uh, my colleague, Associate Professor Amin Muhammad Bui, and some of the colleagues there in the Department of Computer uh, Sciences. So I really encourage this kind of synergy. Now, uh, I talked about language planning and development, and uh, here I would like to quote Word Hawk, who described language planning as a government authorized, long term sustained, and conscious effort to alter language function in a society for the purpose of solving communication problems. Now, uh, in all societies, because there is no society that does not use a language or languages, there are two major problems. There are language problems, there are language based problems. 
And the aim of social linguistics, the area which uh, most of my papers have been written, is to find solutions to these two problems. Language problems are problems that are specifically related to independent languages, like Hausa, like Yoruba, like English, like any other language. A few minutes ago, I said that one of the challenges we have is that our languages, at the moment, we find them extremely difficult to deliver uh, classroom lectures in the sciences because there are limitations. There are insufficient vocabulary to translate what photosynthesis or rectilinear from light is in terms of physics and biology and other areas that we have talked about. So you can only do two things or three. You improve or develop the language so that it can have the carrying capacity to be able to uh, allow a teacher to teach physics, chemistry, and biology. And this will require linguists, grammarians, and others who will sit and see how a particular level be developed so that communication problems in many areas could be solved. So language problems can be found in individual languages. And on the other side, problems that are connected with speakers of these languages. And these are the language-based problems. For example, in doctor relationship, there could be miscarriage of uh, well, not justice, but in terms of the prescription, if the doctor does not understand his, his or her patient well, then the chances are that uh, what he might write for the, or prescribe for the patient might be wrong. What has been the cause of that? Poor language or poor communication. You, you can have also uh, many of us in the classroom with very good uh, uh, lecture notes, but still with poor languages. Again, there will be problems there. For the next 30, one hour might not understand what the teacher is talking about because there is a language problem or language barrier. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the court cases where you have judges who communicate largely in English, and you have litigants or people who might have been apprehended for one criminal activity or the other, if they are taken to court, sometimes you have to get or bring in an interpreter before you can resolve the language problem there. Now the issue is, if an interpreter is not a professional, you could confound the language issue simply because he might not resolve the problem. So in many interactions like this, you could have language-based problems which will require professionals uh, to help resolve them. So these are all related to language planning and development. A country can plan its language and all linguistic capital or resources in a number of ways which may involve assessing resources, complex decision-making, the assignment of different functions, different languages, or varieties of a language in a community, and the commitment of valuable resources. Many countries in the world don't use a single language as a national language. Some of them use two, some three, based on the political arrangement within the country. For example, uh, Switzerland has three languages, which are official languages, uh, German, French, and uh, one language bordering, I think, Italy. And all of these languages are considered as national languages. So multilingualism can push a nation to choose two or three or four languages in order to communicate. But it's not only an issue of multilingualism, there is politics. Language is tied to ethnicity. And if you promote one language, you neglect other, uh, another language or other languages, there is bound to be opposition. And therefore, even when we come to select languages and assign function to them, we have to show elements of equality and egalitarianism. Otherwise, a small issue related to language planning and so policy will set a nation on war. And uh, let me quickly disabuse the minds of those who argue that uh, 
It is because we have so many languages, that's why we have so many problems. It is partly yes and it is partly no. Partly yes because the issues of languages have not been handled. If they have been handled well through planning and policy making, then the problems will be greatly minimized. It's not that you can eliminate all the problems associated with language because of ethnicity that is tied to language. So if you have good planning, good policies, you can minimize, including the issue of education, which I talked about. But then we have currently countries that are monolingual, that you can say are only historically speaking one language. But they went to war, clearly showing that the problem is not with the language, but la rather with the speakers. The Somalis are still fighting themselves. They speak basically only Somali language in that country. But Somali has never known peace since early 1990s, when Syed Bari had to leave that country and settle here in Nigeria to find comfort in a multilingual state, which was a big irony for him. The same thing also can be said about Rwanda. They only healed or are trying to heal now with Kagame, who has been able to leverage many of the political issues of the country. But in the mid 1990s, Ugandans, fellow Ugandans killed fellow Ugandans, and they spoke one language. So, why the argument that it is because we have so many languages, that's why we have so many ethno, religious, and other crises? It is not. Remember, finally, the British fought the Americans during their civil war, and yet they spoke one language. So why the argument of those who say that multilingualism is a breeder of crisis? It is not. It is the individuals who speak these languages who have refused to handle the language issue well. And this is why they give room for crisis. Now, uh, the ascendancy of English and its consequences. We all know how English came here about. And uh, I think I will skip that because issue of Hausa. Uh, Hausa in Nigeria along with Igbo and Yoruba are privileged after English. They are privileged and I think if I have to compare the three, I will, in my opinion, Hausa has been more privileged. When I talk about privilege, I'm talking about the kind of advantages Hausa has enjoyed over the years or generations over and above many other Nigerian languages. And this is why I say, if languages were humans, Hausa as a language would have been said to be born with a silver spoon in its mouth. Because the language has enjoyed a number of privileges, both with regard to linguistic and non-linguistic matters that accounted and still account for its emergence, growth, development, and spread on Nigeria's sociolinguistic horizons. In my opinion, no other indigenous language has enjoyed the privileges Hausa has enjoyed in Nigeria, beginning with its two fellow competitors, that is, Igbo and Yoruba. Even if these two languages had enjoyed anything close to Hausa's privileges or advantages, they did so at a time when Hausa had already gone several extra miles far ahead of them, consolidating its credentials and pushing its status as a potential national language candidate, but lacking such recognition from the Nigerian government and the country's citizens, including from its native speakers, the Hausawa themselves, who seems to have taken things for granted that Hausa could promote itself without their active popular and galvanized support. Indeed, in my opinion, numerous sectors responsible for Hausa's organized development and promotion had come and continue to come surprisingly from the non-Hausa sector. Individuals, groups, associations, and institutions at home in Nigeria and abroad. Yes, if you look at the role of the BBC, which I'll come to later, you can say that uh, the BBC's contribution in spreading Hausa and even developing it is huge. 
in Uganda and I estimate it, especially in the area of translation. Many of us, when we fail to get a vocabulary to help us translate something, we resort to BBC. If you have been gatekeeping or if you have been depositing what you have been listening from the BBC. So now I then list the advantages Hausa has benefited from in Nigeria. I say Hausa, language of kingdoms, city states and governments. Even before independence and before colonialism, the city states of Kano, Zadzau, Gazina and the rest were using Hausa as the official language of government. And of course, when colonial government came, it also decided to use Hausa as the medium. If we remember the indirect rule, Hausa was used as the medium of that. And uh, the early schools that were started, from which mom and dad also were enrolled, were only Hausa speaking in terms of instruction. It was only later that the British, after they had seen that they had established the system well, they decided to change it over to English up to this present, present moment that we are being educated. So you can see that uh, Hausa has enjoyed the advantages of kingdoms, city states, and governments. And even today, if the government fails to reach the majority in the country through English, it has to resort to Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba, and of course other languages. Now, to you that the British actually forced themselves to learn Hausa before they came here to run the colonial government, especially in northern Nigeria, where nobody spoke Hausa at the time they came. Here is a comment from Phillips. He said in 1902, an official notice about the examination, that Hausa examination was issued. Officers were to apply to the secretary for their examination. They were to translate administrative problems in Hausa for six different Africans, none of whom knew English. Every political officer was to pass a lower standard examination in Hausa by the beginning of his second tour, unless he was authorized to take another language. The higher standard was to be passed by the beginning of his second tour. In, any, in short, what they are saying is that no administrative officer as a colonial officer was allowed to join the colonial civil service in northern Nigeria unless and until he was fluent in Hausa. This was no mean advantage for the language at that time. Then uh, I have cited a very, very interesting case cited by the late man Aminu Kano. I think there is a mix up on this page. I am surprised to see it here. Yes. This goes back to a page where I talked about, again, governments that were non-Hausa, but were using Hausa as a medium. Uh, here is a case of the late Adiola, and this is what Mala Aminu Kano said. Uh, a well-known Hausa politician, the late Mala Aminu Kano, paid glowing tributes to Adiola, open quotes, for probably being the first person in this country, if not in the world, to establish a newspaper, Amana, in Hausa language, which he himself could not read well. A paper he entitled totally to Hausa people. This is very rare for any person outside the Hausa community to do. I think Abiola was moved by his genuine feelings, probably religious and political and others. This is something which other Nigerian languages have never enjoyed up to this moment. Then uh, Hausa is companion of madams and merchants. Now, if there are any good carriers and spreaders, people who have helped Hausa to spread, mm. then it is the madams and the merchants. Mm. These are people who have moved from northern Nigeria down to the south of this country and have stayed there for a very long time. And in their life, many of them rarely spoke another language unless they had to do it because they had to sell or to buy from some people. Otherwise, they retained Hausa as the mother tongue in spite of all the years they have stayed there. There is uh, an interesting case of a Kano man who left Kano 
in his 20s and was never seen and was, was never heard about until after 65 years. He came back only last month. This was reported in the Daily Trust. But what was interesting was that, according to the reporter, he never lost his house accent in spite of all those years. There are several of them who are like this. We are not saying that speakers of other languages do not, but if statistics are to be taken, I believe also we have a very large uh, percentage of people of this nature. Then, uh, how's the medium of Islamic and Christian religious communication? This is an area where Hausa also has enjoyed advantage. In uh, states like Bombay, Benue, and others, Hausa is freely used in churches. And this is, nobody has declared Hausa is official language, but they accepted the reality of the fact no. that the critical multilingualism, as is typical of Plato and Benue and similar states, cannot easily be broken. And therefore, the best option in terms of communicating to multilingual uh, people uh, is to ensure that they use a lingua franca. And Hausa has been serving this. You will be surprised that even on certain, uh, well, many of the church songs are composed in Hausa. The dresses sometimes when they are on certain occasions are also in Hausa. And so on and so forth. But uh, sometimes, uh, you even forget that some other languages do exist in certain areas. So I think uh, Hausa has benefited from this, and of course from the Islamic scholars also. Hausa has benefited a lot because uh, preaching either in the mosque or in open air is not there in Hausa. And what this means for the language is that it will get more speakers and also it will consolidate its structural development because. Many of the vocabularies that are translated by the scholars, whether uh, Christian or Muslims, will help the language to grow. Now, the next is the academia. Of the school of academics and for the academia. Here I will only want to cite a quotation by Paul Newman, he says, and he is referring to 1969, the same year I took secondary school, in point to the symbolic importance of 1969, one of the most uh, important was, one, of the, one must note that this was also the year when Professor Galadenshi completed his London PhD dissertation. The first dissertation, as far as I am aware, that's the uh, Paul Mann quoting now, awarded to a Hausa person for a linguistic study of Hausa, he said this turning point was followed by the PhD dissertation of Bashir Ikara at Leeds, 1965. Dauda Bagari, who was here with us sometime at UCLA, 1976. Abba Rufai at Georgetown, 1977. After which Hausa dissertations appeared in rapidly increasing number. The most recent being that of Samani Sani at Indiana, 1988. The numbers of PhDs on Hausa language and literature by houses has grown so large that one cannot mention all of them individually. Now the point being made here is that by 1969, Hausa language already has a PhD in linguistics. This is something rare for most Nigerian languages. Uh, then Hausa, proud owner of a pre-colonial writing system. Here I'm talking about the Ajami. Before the British came, they met the northern people already writing their languages. Yoruba, Yoruba Muslims in the South Elf were also doing the same. The Kanuris were also doing the same. The majority communities were all using different types of Ajami to write their languages as well as use it in various other purposes. This is also something that uh, has interested Newman and he gave us this quotation. He said, the second German scholar one needs to mention is Adam Misleh, whose knowledge of Hausa came from the first-hand experience he had with the language while working as missionary in Togo. Although he lived until 1948, his major Hausa publication, a 1906 uh, dictionary and a 1911 grammar, placed him in the early period. 
Now he mentioned that one of the interesting things about this person's dictionary in Hausa is that all the entries were given in Ajami Arabic script as well as in Boko. That means he used two scripts to write uh, his dictionary. He said a tradition which was dropped by later scholars. These days nobody does that. And then he mentioned that uh, in his case it is fortunate that he did use both scripts. And this has definitely increased the usefulness of his work since his Ajami transcriptions were often more accurate, particularly with regard to bound length than his book transcription. This is very, very important. That Hausa, because of its problem of verb length, uh, can go better with that than the book or script. This is just a point being made by uh, uh, <coughs> uh, this academic here. Then Hausa partner in contemporary entertainment industry here. It's just a point I want to make that uh, the videos, the audio, the podcasts, the YouTubes that we, we watch on Hausa today are in their millions. And this has taken Hausa beyond the borders of Nigeria into other African countries and the world. This is also an advantage Hausa has gained and is still gaining. So by the time you count at the number of audiences that listen to Hausa, you will come up with huge statistics. Next, Hausa most widely diffusing and integrating indigenous Nigerian tongue. Now, this is a very, very important factor. I had, I said, in future, people might not care who is Hausa and who is not Hausa. But people might care about where do you come from. But coming generations, and especially with good Nigeria, with jobs, everything being fine, people might forget. Are you Hausa or you are not Hausa? In the same way, today, the speakers of English surpass the original speakers of English. We, Nigerians, speak in English. Them, South Africans, speak in English. Them, Malaysians, speak in English. Them, Canadians, speak in English, especially those who use French. Them, Singaporeans, speak in English. Them, all over the world, speak in English. We have surpassed the native speakers today. This is what I foresee for Hausa in the coming generations, such that the language will accumulate more speakers. In fact, Jen uh, Payden, 1968, has made this comment. He said, the creation of a lingua franca, Hausa, has substantially aided northern political integration. The creation of a northern language area, that is northern Nigeria, has already added a new dimension to the already close relationship between political structure and linguistic units. The issue about Arewa Arewa, much of the strength of Arewa is rooted in its ability to speak house language. Then he says in another place, Hausa still remains the only indigenous Nigerian language that has been instrumental in effectuating political integration within a context of complex ethnic pluralism. It has done this in the 19th century on an emirate level and in the 20th century on the regional level. Don't forget that during the Northern Nigerian government, the parliament or house of assembly had a bilingual handset or bilingual, uh, 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 yes, handset, because that's the way we called it when I was being trained. These are the uh, deliberations of the members of the house. So in Kaduna, they will produce a handset which was in Hausa as well as, as in English, simply because Hausa was recognized because there were many emirs who could not speak English, but they are also members of the parliament in Kaduna. Now, uh, I have on page 41, if you have this book, a research conducted by someone in 1941 I was then just graduating at the University of Jos. And this was published in a newspaper. He is called, or he was called Dr. Okuyatu Ikwe, or something like that, because uh, I always question my student. I said, don't pronounce them of any, you have seen in written. Ask him, sir, how to pronounce them? Because he will love it better than to make a critical mistake which will offend him, and probably he might even take offense. So, uh, 
I have not, and I have never met Mr. Okuyato, okay, to ask him how to pronounce it. Uh, the, pro the name of Muhammad, I go by Muhammad, I go by Muhammad, there is also Muhammad, there is so many. So always please ask, especially if you are an author. So how do you pronounce, or even how do you write? Now, what Ikwe did was, he wrote about education in northern Nigeria, but hammering it on the language question. Then he came out with a typology of multilingualism in northern Nigeria. And by 1981, there are only 19 states in the country. 10 states were in the north, 9 in the south. Now this is his result. He has four columns. Serial number, state, language, typology. Bauchi, House of Fulani, and others. He called assimilate. Benu, Doma, Igala, and others. Multilingua. Borno, Kanuri, House, and others. Assimilate. Then he has monoglot mono states like Kano and like Sokoto, the only two. Now, 1981 to 2021, how many years today? A lot of water has passed under the bridge. So I decided to revisit uh, 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 Dr. Ikwe's uh, And my other hypothesis is on the 44. And instead of limiting myself to only the northern states, I decided to take the whole country. And this is what I have come out with. I call it typology of Hausa linguistic assimilatory tendencies in Nigeria, because these tendencies are there. Now, I have four uh, terms that I'm using. I adopted Ikwe's assimilate, but giving it to different states. And then I introduced near assimilation, and then uh, near assimilate and non assimilate and what I call neutral assimilate. So here I go, Abia, Igbo and others, non-assimilate, Adamawa, Fulful De, Bata, Hausa and others, near assimilate, Akwa Ibon, Anan, Ibibio, Ogoja and others, non-assimilate, Anambra, non-assimilate, Bauchi, near assimilate, Baelsa, non-assimilate, Benue, neutral assimilate, Borno, near assimilate, Cross River, Non assimilate, Delta, non assimilate, Ebon, non assimilate, Edo, non assimilate, Ekiti, non assimilate, Enugu, non assimilate, Gombe, near assimilate, Imo, non assimilate, Jugawa, assimilate. There are six assimilates from Kebi to Sokoto to Kasina to Kano to Jigawa, and I stop there. I call those as assimilate. Or if you like, you can add the D and say assimilate. But the idea is how the sociolinguistic uh, climate of this state. But those that are non-assimilate are mostly in the south. Mm -hmm. Then in the middle belt, I have three uh, states that are called uh, neutral assimilate. Uh, the doctor who did his work in 81 had only Kwara and Benue. Kogi was not created there. I now brought Kogi as part of the uh, neutral assimilate. Again, neutral myth, it is partly non-assimilate, it is partly also possible. Because Hausa has large pockets of uh, speakers. If you go to Makurki, you will be surprised what is the dominant language there. Even though uh, historically, probably, Hausas were uh, immigrants there. So anyway, thus you can have a look at this typology. And this typology is supposed to be ongoing. By 2050 or 3030, for those who will be there, the typology will be different. Because this is a process of language change. It's a very slow process, but it is occurring and is stimulating. So I have on page 45, the typology of household linguistic assimilatory tendencies in Nigeria in percentages. So if you look at the percentages, uh, non-assimilate is 39, uh, near uh, assimilate is 45 and so on and so forth. So I, ha I have represented the four types that we have there and you can have a look at them and possibly you can now start to review my own. Let me finally say that uh, I have only one important aspect uh, that I want to talk about. Uh, all these things that I have said represent houses prospects also.
prepare the predicaments. The predicaments are many because it is not easy for Igbos and Yorubas and all other Nigerians to simply accept Hausa to be, to be the national language of Nigeria. It's not likely we will see that day. I, I, I doubt what type of Nigerians will accept this. Or, on the other hand, declare Igbo as the national language of Nigeria. There should be a different type of Nigerians, not us. Or allow uh, Yoruba to be the national language. Or Kanuri, or Ibibio, or Ijo, or any other. This is not likely to be in our time. What is the solution? The solution is we should have regional, regional language policies. And this is where I call for linguistic restructuring. We are calling for restructuring, but it's political. I'm calling for linguistic restructuring. What do I mean by this? I am saying now, let me drop the booklet. I'm saying that if you look at the Constitution, 1999 Constitution, there are only two provisions in relation to language uh, policy. That is one, language in education policy, which is also faulty because it's not being seriously pursued, where they say that the mother tongue should be the medium of instruction in primary one, two, three, or thereabout. Nobody is really working hard to see that, what is happening. I believe what is happening in the North is different from what is happening in the South in relation to these policies, if they are policies at all. The second one is in relation to the language of communication in the House, in the Parliament. In the North, and in the Southwest, and even in Southeast, somehow, when they are pleased, they use Nigerian languages like Hausa, Ibo, and Yoruba. In Kano, I think Kano has one of the best record. Sokoto also they do. But I agree that it is not consistent and it is not comprehensive. If they are going out for Hausa completely, they should go for Hausa. We have the capacity, we have the capability to translate and produce the English version, just like what I said was happening in Kaduna. Because this then will take care of the marginalization that our languages suffer. So, uh, therefore, with only these two uh, areas of language policy, and with a country that has over 500 languages, I'm sorry to say that we cannot adequately, or government can't adequately tackle all the language-based issues that I talked about previously. So, uh, what do we do first? I say that we have to uh, review the Constitution again, like others are asking for review, but my quest for review is linguistic, theirs is political, or whatever time you can give it, so that we in include more language provisions, like India has done. India has about 11 official languages. And no, South Africa has 11. In in India has about 23, in addition to English and Hindi. Then it has 23 because virtually every uh, uh, province or region has its own media and government has to ensure that it takes care. By the way, during a conference in 1996 in Spain, uh, in Barcelona, uh, the UN decided that to strengthen democracies in the world, there is need to enshrine what is called linguistic rights. There are two areas of rights, talk, as talked by Ali Masru late. Right of languages and right for languages. Right of languages is for me to be allowed to use my mother tongue wherever I have official duties. And it is the responsibility of government to provide translators for me where there is a problem. Currently, we don't have this kind of provision. Translations are done, but they are not mandatory. You can look for anybody in the court or somewhere in the hospital and say, please come and help us interpret this. There is danger in doing this. I pointed this out. Uh, the Italians say translators are traitors. And they are right. In 1906, 1906, here in Zaria, a colonial officer was killed because the translator mistranslated. 
and the people who are his audience immediately pounced on him. He never knew what happened. He was killed. This is the reality. I reported this in one of my papers. So the issue is we need linguistic restructuring. The federal government should not impose any language on any state on and on any local government. In the constitution, there should be provision that states and local governments have a right to use the languages they want at their level because they are with the people who speak this language. So federal government can retain any language it wishes to. And of course, the most probable language is English. But there is no rationale at state and local government to say that English has to dominate. At least you need to delineate the functions of English versus the functions of the local languages that are found there. Finally, I said why we are waiting for this restructuring. The houses can do a number of things. And this is what I will read as my final message. First of all, there is need for pressure, language pressure groups, who should uh, actually campaign for linguistic rights. Rights of languages and rights for languages. Rights for speakers of languages and rights for those languages. And uh, other things that I said is that there should be a total mobilization of all speakers of Hausa in the above states, that is in assimilated states. Six states of Kedi, Sokoto, Zamfara, Kasina, Kano, and Jigawa. Because uh, Gombe and the Bauchi I deliberately call near assimilate because of the complex sociolinguistic uh, problems there. Then uh, this mobilization should see to the projects for the development of Hausa. Then I have uh, requested for language bodies, just like the colonial officers did. We need language bodies, we need competitions like that. One is just about, I think, to be finished in the university here uh, on Hausa. Such things are needed, because you can't do language policy without them. I also said that uh, a National Hausa Teachers Association, Nahata, should be set up. A House of Language Technology Association, HALTA, should be also set up. A center for Ajami research is urgently needed to help resuscitate and develop houses age long and more natural and familiar writing systems. A powerful website for the promotion of Hausa should be received And of course, uh, the conclusion is the rest of it. Yes, so thank you very much, distinguished uh, members of the audience. I also wish to thank the university for allowing me to stand here to finally close the chapter, even if temporarily, of my stay here. Thank you very much. Can you please give a standing yeah. ovation in honor of Professor Nairo Muhammad Arbungu, our teacher, the 23rd inaugurino. Uh, thank you very much. Allah uh, Ayyaba. Let me quickly also thank you very much. You can take your seats. Uh, in honor of the inaugurate, uh, Professor Nair Muhammad al the chairman of his chapter, Nagalta Old Boys Association, al Hajjani Musa, is here with some of his members. You are welcome. Uh, Professor Mansour Saeed, Faculty of Law in the former DPC administration of this university. Sir, can you thank you for the recognition? Thank you, sir. Uh, let me also recognize Professor Tukur Adamu. Professor Adamu Abakumbu's family are also uh, mem uh, family members are here. Uh, he will have done the presentation himself, uh, but uh, uh, they are all here, members of the family and their friends and relations. Al Haji Karaba Belluyabu, former principal of federal government. College Sokoto, classmate to Professor Dr. Muhammad Arugungu, and Chairman Sokoto State Teacher Service Board is also here. Please stand up, Professor Dr. Uh, Professor Bellyaba and the Chairman uh, Nagata Old Boys. Uh, Professor Sadia Umar Bello is also here. She is a 26th in Oguri. Professor Sadia Umar Bello, can you please? Uh, yes, she is going to present her inaugural lecture soon. 
trying to fix in the line of uh, you know, uh, Dr. Balabasa to Ibrahim is also here. She is the head of translations English to Hausa. Umar uh, for Technic. Dr. Balabasa to please for recognition. Uh, while I was making a, a kind of protocol, preventive protocol, I quickly seized Dr. Fada Renure and his students to Usman Kamfori University. <laughs> he is the, the head of the Department of English, Language and Linguistics, Sokoto State University, not Usman Kamfori University. Anche Bankin Neba Yukuri Midani. You can now see one thing I want to say or to reiterate here is that. Did you notice, the audience, did you notice that Professor Naira Rungu, while presenting his uh, lecture, was not using any pair of glasses? Did you notice that he was not, apart from his agility, he was not using also glasses? Okay, and also some of our students from Sokolov State University are here also. So the, the major presentation, or a lot of presentations he made here are relevant, very relevant to courses we teach here. You now see the applications. You see national language policy, language planning, all these courses we teach you in social linguistics, applied linguistics and so on. You see what we are talking. I can recall about 21 years ago when we were students of Argumbu. You know, those of us in English, we took Hausa courses. We are interested, especially those of us who are in the media then, because we know the importance of translation. Arugumbu was given the task of teaching the hardest aspect of translation. Translation of biological, physical sciences aspects. These are the areas. And uh, we benefited a lot during that time. So we wish him Allah's guidance and we wish him more years of life on earth. Uh, let me now quickly invite uh, Professor Aminu Ma uh, Muhammad Aminu Mode for the vote of thanks. But before that also, I would like to recognize Basit Ahmed, a veteran journalist. He's also here with us. Yes, the next inaugural lecture <coughs> is going to be presented on 28th July 2021 by Professor Ian Osaru from Lab Science. He's the next inaugural. Professor Abode. Alhamdulillah, I'm really excited and delighted at the same time with this presentation. And I am contemplating where to begin my vote of thanks. But uh, as usual, since that is a normal way of doing it, I will follow it. Uh, first, to begin with, Alhamdulillah. We remain grateful to Allah for sparing our lives and uh, giving us good health to be here to attend this extraordinary lecture, which is well presented. And uh, secondly, I will begin by saying we thank the VC, Professor Lowell Suleiman Bibis, who is well and ably represented by DV's administration, Professor Ibrahim Magawata. I equally say thank you to the principal officers here present, our dean, my dean, faculty of arts and Islamic studies, uh, whose faculty is the faculty of uh, Professor Dima Argum. So we say thank you, sir, and may God bless all of you. I will continue to say thank you to all distinguished scholars here, uh, deans, professors, directors from other faculties. In fact, there is no faculty that is not represented here. I have seen so many faces. In fact, even the faces that I have taken long to see, I have seen them here. And so we say, may Allah uh, pay you back uh, in a better way. Uh, I say thank you to all of us here. Also, the committee chairman, Professor Ahmed Bako, who is the chairman of the committee for another lecture in our great university here. In fact, the whole front line is full of elders of the university. In fact, for this, I will not be able to mention, I will just choose two to represent all, because they are really full uh, to the capacity. The whole line is my teachers, elders of the university, 
I can see Professor Amin Salim Dikadilo, who was a three-time VC in different universities. I will see us. Uh, Professor Tukura Ramir is here, who was a former rector in the Prasad Baltagan. Our teacher, teacher of teachers, Professor Ayo Salaw is here. Professor Balarabe, former library, immediate past librarian of the university, as the immediate uh, first uh, division administration, Professor Yama Yasaidu, Professor Yase Yakasai, who we fondly call the Chinese man, and my teacher, <laughs> Professor Haruna Abdullah Hiberniwa. I am a man proud and grateful for what I learned from him. Uh, Dr. Atuo is there, his two classmates, and my good friend, Professor Songfada from the vet medicine, and all other colleagues from the management science, Professor Mukhtar Alti, Professor, uh, who would I, please pardon me, even not only the eyes of my teachers, even my own eyes are weakening uh, as they passes. Uh, Professor Akin Hassan, Professor Shiru so many. Uh, my good friend Bella Rabi and Professor Emera, all. Please pardon me, I will not be able to mention all, but I must continue to mention among the female. Professor Sadia, my teacher is also here, and other colleagues. I also remain grateful, we remain grateful, because I'm taking on behalf of the modern European languages and linguistics department. And so, we shall thank you to all, and particularly, and especially, and especially to Hadia Hawad, who gave all the necessary support our teacher required before he became what he became because we have learned from what has been read from the citation. And other colleagues here, we say thank you very much. My fellow students, we say thank you. The people from the media, we say a very good thank you because we want you to disperse the information, propagate it, let it be known that our 23rd inaugural lecture has been delivered today and successfully and in an extraordinary way. Our 21st inaugural lecture will come up uh, next week by our colleagues and it will continue. We say thank you, may Allah reward all of us. May Allah take you back home or your hostel in the case of students safely and may you pass your examination well. Thank you. Inshallah. Yeah, let me make uh, an announcement to Father State uh, or express the line of, of inauguration. You know, Related in this university. Like we earlier mentioned, the 24th inaugural is Professor Ian Osaro from Lab Science. He will present his inaugural, he will do his inaugural lecture on the 28th of this month. Then the 25th inaugural is Professor M. G. Abubakar from Biochemistry Department. The 26th inaugural is Professor Saidia Umaradello from the Center for Hausa Studies. I now invite Professor Ayo Salaw for the closing prayer. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We thank Almighty Allah for the grace given to Professor Arno to present I said something before I started. I said we have a lot of us who are professors over 20 years ago and are not presented. This is a pointer. Please let us try and do something. ولا نعبد إلا إياك ولا نستهين إلا إياك اللهم إنا كل أرواح مقانا فقينا كل شيء بأثم مقانا وعدينا صراطك سويا دوما وتوفنا مسلمين وجحي دوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين أبيني يا الله يا تلا إذا أرونا إياك يا أرونا كيف أرونا كيف أرونا there is a group picture immediately outside the representatives of the vice chancellor, the inaugural 
and the members of the High Temple and the invited guests. There's going to be a great picture outside. Thank you.